I'm Dr. John Newfelt, and uh, you're watching Back to the Bible Canada, and I'm delighted to have you join us in our scripture study. Uh, we've been talking at Back to the Bible Canada about what we can do to make sure that people are grounded in scripture. And uh, I and others have agreed together that we need to return to basics and talk about things that are foundational to our faith. And given that we're called Back to the Bible Canada, um, the foundation of our faith are found in Scripture itself. And I've wondered what one would say to someone would say, you know, what is Christianity all about? Where do I begin? How do I start studying? I mean, how, how can you lead me to the place that is the foundation? I want to say that when you read your Bible, and remember, there are 66 books that make up the Bible. Uh, the Bible is written over a period of, of 1,600 years. Uh, we have 66 separate writings. Um, we have you know, over 40 different authors. The Bible was written in three different languages. Um, it was written on three different continents. Um, it was written by people who are everything from kings uh, to people who are in prison and everything in between. That is to say, it's written by people from every socioeconomic grouping. And all of these 66 writings of the Bible that are written over a period of 1,600 years, I mean, all of that, you know, it, it tells one story. Um, but if you're starting to read the Bible for the very first time, um, it's important not to begin at the beginning and just read your way through. I don't think you're going to make it. I think it's important to read those books which are intended to be foundational books and then to read those books that are intended to build on that later on. So the real question is, if you're a novice, if you're starting out, where should you start? Or even if you've been a believer for a number of years and you've wondered, did I ever get the proper foundation? Um, but let me help you with that. If you're reading in the New Testament, which is where you should begin, uh, you should begin with three foundational books. One of those foundational books ought to be either Matthew, Mark, or Luke, which are the three books in the new, first three books in the New Testament. I mean, those are foundational. A second foundational book ought to be the book of John, which is what I'm going to start on today. And a third foundational book ought to be the book of Romans. Those three books form the foundation upon which everything else is built. Once you've got a good working knowledge of that and know how to apply that to your own life, there are three books in the Old Testament that are foundational. One is the book of Genesis, the second is the book of Deuteronomy, and the third is the book of Isaiah. Those ought to be foundational, and then a number of Psalms ought to be foundation as well. And then after that, you begin to build on that and get a, a sense of the whole. So let me help you with why I say those books are foundational. Uh, if you open up your Bible, you'll know that the first part is called the Old Testament or something I like to call the First Testament. The problem I have with old is that old in a lot of people's eyes speak about something that's outdated. It's not true of the first 39 writings in our Bible. They are the First Testament, that is, they lead to and are an introduction to the main course, which is the New Testament. The New Testament begins with the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which basically means that they start with the story of the life of Jesus, who is the centerpiece of everything the Bible writes about. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written by three different people, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they tell the story of Jesus. We also call them synoptic gospels. In other words, they cover the same material. You know, some people, when they first read the New Testament, are shocked because they find out that the first three books in the Bible sound so similar, it's like, boy, we're reading through the same thing all over again. It's not precisely true, but it is, you know, somewhat true. And, and here's what the issue is. Jesus uh, was born about, let's say, 4 BC. I know that sounds strange, 4 before Christ, Christ was born. But as a matter of fact, our calendars are slightly off. So let's say Jesus was born about 4 BC, and he was either crucified in the year 30 or the year 33 AD. So if you can uh, think about it in that term, so just for argument's sake, let's say 33 AD is the date of the crucifixion and of the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, from that point in time, um, it's about 20 years until the first uh, life of Jesus is written, and that's the book of Mark. So let me tell you something about the book of Mark. Uh, 
It was probably written in the early 50s, so about 20 years after Jesus died and rose again. The Gospel of Mark appears. Um, And it's an interesting book. It's written by a man by the name of Mark. He's not one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. However, what we know about Mark is that he was fluent in Greek, in Hebrew, in Latin, so he was probably fairly educated. He came from a more wealthy class of people. Uh, We also know that the book was written primarily to Roman Gentile Christians because as far as we know, Mark was probably living uh, in Rome itself when he wrote the book of Mark. Uh, There was an ancient church father by the name of Papias, and Papias claims to quote from John, who is one of the original 12, that Mark actually recorded the book of Mark from Peter himself. So he would have watched Peter preaching for some time, followed Peter in his preaching, took notes from the preaching, and then wrote the book of Mark with Peter overseeing the work itself. Now that's probably right. That's probably what we have in the book of Mark. Um, It is written for Roman Latin Christians uh, who are Gentiles and who are wanting to understand the life of Jesus. The reason for the writing of Mark is because it's now been 20 years since Jesus has risen from the dead and gone up into heaven. And Mark is specifically conscious of the fact that it may be longer than it might have been expected for Jesus to come back again. And he wants to leave a written record of it. And that's what we have in the Gospel of Mark. Then sometime, I mean, this is now um, in the mid-50s, sometime in the late 50s, uh, Matthew writes, maybe it's the early 60s as well, I'm just guessing somewhat, but in the, in the late 50s or early 60s, Matthew begins to write, and Matthew goes over the same material, but he expands it. Uh, And Matthew also has in mind that he's writing for a particularly Jewish audience who understand the First Testament very well, and he wants to show Jews living in his day that Jesus truly is the long-awaited Messiah. So you've got Mark writing, Matthew writes after that, and then finally Luke writes. Uh, Luke as well is not one of the 12, uh, but Luke uh, was under the tutelage of the Apostle Paul, Uh, What we know about Luke is that uh, he was an Antiochian, which in our day we would say he was a Syrian. Um, He also uh, would have been by profession a physician in his day, but he also was more than an amateur historian. He was quite an accomplished historian. And what he seems to have done is interviewed the 12 apostles or the 11 and interviewed them as well as others who saw the life of Jesus. And then overseen by the Apostle Paul, he puts together a comprehensive life of Jesus. So you get Matthew, Mark, and Luke that seem fairly similar, but they're different at the same time because each one of them brings a unique perspective of the life of Jesus. So those three have been written. Well, we do know that by the time we get close to the end of the first century, we already have discovered a copy, for instance, of the book of Mark, if far away as Alexandria, which is in Egypt. So you can imagine that these three writings of the life of Jesus are being copied and copied and copied. So imagine a day in which you don't have, you know, a printing press as we do today, and you're not able to, you know, spit out books as frequently as we can. So how are you going to get copies of something? You're going to have to get someone who copies it by hand. So if you're in a given church somewhere, you've got a copy of the life of Jesus written by Mark. Uh, Somebody's going to have to copy that so that your preaching pastors got them. And maybe the other elders who also preach all need their own copy. But your Sunday school teacher needs a copy as well as somebody who leads a Bible study. So you have multiple copies and now they're being produced by the thousands. One person after another after another copying these texts. And they all come from an eyewitness perspective. So it's possible now to teach people who weren't there when Jesus actually lived from the pen of somebody who was there, who can communicate that, but that person can't make it to your church, but he's left a writing. So that's how we got what we got. Well, how about the Gospel of John? It's also a life of Jesus, but it's different than the other three. And here I need to explain myself. By the time John writes, 
it's now either the late 80s or it's the early 90s. By that time, all of the other apostles have already died. They've died a martyr's death. John alone is left alive. A couple of other things have happened as well. Uh, one, uh, we're now past the year AD 70. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, let me explain. Uh, in the late 60s and in the early 70s AD, the world changed for Jews. Uh, in AD 70, the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem because of the fight which the Jewish freedom fighters had with the Romans who were oppressing them and taking away their religious rights. It eventually, to make a long story short, ended up in a Roman siege of the city of Jerusalem. The Romans finally, after a long siege, were able to break through the walls of Jerusalem. And in their anger by that time, the Romans were so infuriated by the Jewish resistance that they came in like, you know, just a house on fire and they lit the house on fire. In fact, they burned the temple in Jerusalem to the ground and slaughtered the Jews in mass and drove all of the Jews from the promised land. So after AD 70, the Jews were driven from Israel and didn't manage to get back there until the year 1948. So you can imagine what actual destruction was done by the, by the Romans. So now Jerusalem is burned to the ground, and you have to imagine that prior to AD 70, Jerusalem would have been the center of the Christian faith. But now it's a smoldering pile of ruins. There is no center of the Christian faith, at least not there. However, because of evangelization and church planting by Paul and others, the Christian church has been growing and expanding into areas that were in the Gentile world. By the time John writes the book of John, that is in the late 80s or early 90s, um, John is living in Ephesus. Now, if you don't know where Ephesus is, it's a city that no longer exists today, except um, there's a, it's the largest archeological dig in the world is the archeology span of digging up Ephesus. They've dug up maybe about a third of the thing. They still have a lot of work to do, which is gonna take a long time into the future. But in its day, Ephesus was right along the coast, if you can imagine, on the western end of Turkey, overlooked the Mediterranean Sea, and it was a shipping harbor, and it was one of the great cities of the ancient world. A great church had been established there. John became the leading elder, uh, apostle, and bishop of all the churches in the area, and he lived in Ephesus. He would have taken Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, to Ephesus with him, and she would have lived with him until she died in an old age, and she, in fact, is buried there. So John is, in fact, pastoring there, and if it's the early 90s, imagine this. Jerusalem no longer exists. Uh, the apostles are no longer alive. And a new generation has now come into being. Some of them were actually raised in a Christian home. For the first time ever, what we've got is believers actually being raised in the home of believers. That's a new phenomenon. Until then, the Christian church was made up of all new converts. For the first time, you have a second generation of believers. And the real question in John's day was, yeah, it's true that it's now become familiar uh, that uh, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus in order to be saved from your sins and have the assurance of eternal life. Yeah, that's true. But what does it mean to believe? Uh, the problem with Christianity has always been the problem of the second generation. The first generation encounters Jesus for the first time and they seize upon him as the fountain of all life. The second generation has had Jesus as a stable factor, and they need to go over the same material again and discover for themselves afresh what it means to believe and to make their faith their own. Now, in our day, so let me fast forward to the day in which we live, which is you know, a part of North American culture. Now, the Christian faith, uh, to many people in North America, I mean, they don't know what it is, so they're struggling with what it is. However, North American culture has had a great many churches that form the foundation for the kind of culture that we are. So that the name of Jesus is well known in our culture. 
If I tell you I wanna speak to you about Jesus, most people in North America will not say, never heard of him. We've all heard of him. So in that sense, John is very relevant to a people who have heard the name Jesus, know something about him, have heard about churches, and even if they haven't read the Bible, they still have some cursory knowledge of Jesus. And John comes along and says, if you've heard something about Jesus, let me go over the material again a second time. In fact, let me bring up things about the life of Jesus that were not told in the first three Gospels, and I bring them now to your attention so that you might know what to believe. In fact, if I'm gonna describe the book of John to you, let me take you to the second last chapter of John, which is John chapter 20, and I'm reading here from verse 30. John writes, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. In other words, what we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not an exhaustive story of the life of Jesus. It is a complete story, but Jesus did many other things not written in this book. John writes, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, to say Christ, I need to say something that you may or may not know. To say Christ is not to say Jesus' last name. His name is not Jesus Christ, like mine is John Neufeld. See, that's not who Jesus is. Uh, the Greek word Christos, Christ, is a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach. It simply means Messiah. So many other things Jesus did that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the long expected Jewish Messiah. He's also the son of God, says John, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I wanna go over the material of Jesus so that you might ask yourself, when I came to believe in Jesus, did I gain life or did I not? See, the, the whole purpose for telling the story of Jesus is so that you might have life. That's the, that's the entire reason this book is written. So it's written to a new group of Christians who've come on the scene, people who weren't there when Jesus lived and died and rose again, but they are now the next generation. It's also written to people who now don't have a chance to go to Jerusalem and revisit the sites that are talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written while Jerusalem still existed. So anyone who wanted to know if these things actually happened could go visit that place and discover it for themselves. Now it lies in ruins. So John is writing to simply say, I'm gonna go over some of the material of Jesus and I'm gonna tell you what it all means and help you to discover what believing actually means and how by believing you can have the kind of life that I'll talk about in this book. See, that's why John is foundational to understanding the Christian faith. It's given to us to help us do some self-examination. Have you heard about Jesus? Did you know that he healed, that he, um, that he cleansed lepers, that he drove out demons, that he walked on water? Did you know of some of the sermons that he gave? And did you understand what a splash that made? Well, yeah, I've heard about some of that. Well, let me go over some of the stories of Jesus and let me ask you how it's impacted your life. Did you come to understand that you could be given real life? And did you understand who Jesus truly was? So that's what we have in John. So with all that as an introduction, <laughs> uh, what's this book all about? That's why it's foundational. So I've said you take either Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you make it the first book that you study. Uh, if you have some understanding of the Old Testament, I suggest you start with Matthew. Uh, if you don't, and uh, you have a shorter attention span, I'm gonna say you start with Mark. Uh, if you want to know something about Jesus that also includes some of his wise sayings, includes how he ministered to women and, and how the Holy Spirit impacts uh, your own life through Jesus, well, you start with Luke. So you start with one of those three. You migrate over to John, and then also you deal with the book of Romans. Uh, Romans is foundational because it has... In seminal form, the gospel that every single community heard when they established a church. So those, you know, one of those three books are, are foundational to the New Testament and therefore foundational to your faith. I'm starting with John, and I'll do a study of just chapter one to whet your appetite. 
help you to understand why this book is so fascinating. And if you've never read it, I'm gonna promise you, you've probably never read anything that sounds even close to this. I hope I'll open your eyes to see who Jesus is and what it means to believe in him. That's what this book is about. Okay, well, with all that said, uh, let's start to read John chapter one, verse one, which will, if you listen carefully, is gonna help you to understand why this book is, uh, is different than the other gospels. It, it begins by saying, in the beginning, so I'll stop. Uh, if you read Mark, Mark doesn't even have a birth narrative of Jesus. You know, it's just a fast, action-packed gospel. It starts with Jesus beginning to preach and the response that happens. If you go to Matthew or to go to Luke, they'll start with a birth narrative of Jesus. What happened when Jesus was born? So forth. John doesn't have the, the birth narratives in that same fact. He doesn't. He starts with a phrase, in the beginning. Now, we have to stop there because that's how our Bible starts. Genesis 1, verse 1, which are the first words recorded in Scripture, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So when the Bible uses that phrase, in the beginning, it speaks about the beginning of the created order. It talks about the beginning of matter. It talks about the beginning of God creating all things. So in the beginning, says Genesis, there was only the one solitary God, and from this one God, all things came into being. That's how in the beginning starts. But John says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, we have to stop here and say, wow, in the beginning was the Word. Now, I know that some of you who know the book of John will want me to get ahead of myself and will say, yeah, later on, John will explain what he means by the Word. He'll say, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word of God took upon itself not spoken form, but a flesh form, a real body, and Jesus is the Word of God. That's where John will go, and eventually he will, but just before you jump there, watch what happens in this. In the beginning was the Word. Now, you have to stop here, and John is cognizant that there are a number of people who begin to read this who have some understanding of the First Testament. So what I want to do is to take you back to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, or the First Testament, and, and let me read to you some of the Psalms that speak about God's creation of all things. I'm reading, first of all, from Psalm 29, beginning at verse uh, 3, and it starts this way. It says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. In other words, when he speaks, whole nations and parts of geography begin to tremble. And then it says, the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. In other words, when God speaks, his speech is so much different than every other speech we've ever heard. Now think of it this way. I mean, we live in a world of words, 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 words. I mean, you pick up a newspaper, you take, pick up a book, uh, you go to blog sites or Twitters or tweets, um, you know, you, you watch a television program. I mean, everywhere we turn, people are speaking to us. Words are everywhere, and they seem to be the cheapest commodity around. Everyone's got an opinion of something. Everyone's got something to say. Everyone's trying to get more people to listen to them. That's what words seem like in our culture. However, and this is what Psalm 29 says, it says God's word is unlike everything else. He speaks the word and the deer gives birth. He speaks the word and the forest is stripped bare. In other words, some great, you know, nature-like catastrophic event has occurred. Maybe a, you know, a volcano has gone off and you know, we've got this pyroflastic flow and it just strips everything. That is the voice of God. Whenever God speaks, nature responds to him. That's what Psalm 29 says. 
Wow, okay. Um, let me now take you uh, to Psalm chapter 33 and verse six, another Psalm, and it says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. So, so if you think about it this way, uh, God is not in the Bible like some of the ancient pagan deities of that day. I mean, the pagan deities were what we like to call sweating deities. If they created, it would take a great deal of work to do it. God creates with ease. He simply speaks the word and it's done. If he says, let there be light, there's an explosion of light throughout the universe. That's how God is. That's why his word is different than all other words. His word actually is spoken, but when he speaks, something is accomplished, okay? With that in mind, let me take you to one more passage about God's word, and this one's found in the book of Isaiah, and it's in Isaiah chapter 55, 10 and 11. Uh, the passage says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Uh, it's gonna be an analogy, and the analogy is just like rain or snow. So just like rain or snow, it comes down. Now, in terms of snow, it might come down from a glacier or, you know, there's snow up in the mountains and it melts in the spring. And so, you know, there's a runoff and water comes flowing down onto the landscape. Rain, it falls out of the sky. But we know that it doesn't go back to where it came from without accomplishing something. That is, before the, the water is evaporated and then returns to the clouds and eventually snows back up on the mountain, something has happened that is on the earth, they were seeds on the earth, and they were germinated by what came out of the sky. In other words, those water droplets are not going to return back to where they went until something is accomplished on the earth. Now that's the analogy. And then the, verse 11 says, so therefore in the same way, God is speaking here, shall my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. That is, whatever God says is accomplished. It's like the rain that comes down from the sky. It's accomplished. Now, I can say, look, here's what I'd like to accomplish. And then sometimes I might pull it off and other times, you know, maybe because of my poor attitude or bad discipline or sometimes because of some unforeseen event, I can't carry out what I thought I should do or what I promised you'd do. That's different with God. He simply speaks and when his word is spoken, it stands fast. So it's not unusual then, given that background that comes from the First Testament, that John 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. That is, before anything else came into being, before anything outside of God came into being, there was the Word, says John. God with his powerful Word who speaks and it comes to be. So in the beginning was the word, and then John adds something, and he says, and the word was with God. It's a very important thing to say. You see, because sometimes, especially in the mouths of liars or in the mouths of deceivers, what they say and who they are is different. They wanna give an impression of themselves by the words that they speak, which will confuse us so that we don't know who they actually are. Uh, not so with God, because the word is ever present with God. No distinction is to be made between the word and God. What God speaks is an accurate reflection of his character. So, and the word was with God, and then John adds, and the word was God. So John says, you can't make a distinction between God and the word. The word is God. Now, having said that, he says, he, that is the word, that's interesting, now he personifies the word. He, the word, was in the beginning with God. Now then he's gonna say, now look, all things were made through him, that is through Jesus, and then adds, without him was not anything made that was made. Now, you might say, well, that sounds like a bit of a complicated uh, sentence, so let me try to simplify it. Imagine two circles here. Let's say this circle here, in this category, are all made things, all things created, all things that at one point in time weren't existent, that they came into being. Um, philosophers 
sometimes call this contingent things. That is, their, their, their existence is contingent on something else. You want an example of that, it's easy. Um, I'm a contingent being. The reason for my existence, the reason I exist at all, is because a number of years ago, my mother and father made love. And through that, a sperm penetrated an egg, and that's the reason for my existence. Now, that's the immediate reason for my existence, but it's not the long-term reason for my existence. You know, um, I might say, well, yeah, but how did my mom and dad come into being? Well, it turns out they both had parents that had the same experience, and they had parents and so forth, but as we continue to work back, we know it doesn't go back infinitely. There was a time when there were no parents. And so ultimately, the reason for the existence of all contingent things is because there has to be something outside of contingent things that brings contingent things into existence. So on the one hand, they're all things that have been made. These are contingent things, they're temporal things, they're things that once didn't exist and once won't, and in the future won't exist again. So that's contingent things. So uh, all things, that are contingent were made through him, and without him was not one thing made that has been made. Now, so if you can imagine, I said two categories. One is contingent things, created things, made things, and on the other hand are non-contingent things or things, non-made things, things that exist by necessity. They exist because necessity says they always must exist. Now, how many things are in that category? The answer is only one thing, God, the uncreated creator, God, the non-contingent being, God, the being that does not exist because something else created him. So, you know, it makes no sense to say, well, where did God come from? The answer is uh, God doesn't come from anywhere. He exists of necessity. So here's what John says. All things were made through him. That is, everything in this category, the contingent things, all those things, the made things, the created things, were made by the word. Not, was, not one thing made that has been made. Nothing exists in that category that was not made through him. So when John begins the story of Jesus, he starts at the point of creation and he says, look, I'm talking here, when I talk about Jesus, as him who is God's word, who is both with God and God at the same time, and who exists in a category of one. He is one with God who entered into our universe. So John says, I can't tell you about the story of Jesus if I don't tell you first the story of whom we're talking about. Uh, we're talking, you know, about the eternally existent one. In fact, it's been said of verse 3 here, all things were made through him. Without him, not one thing was made that has been made. Um, that if Jesus is a created being, then according to John 1, 3, he'd have had to create himself, which, as we know, is a logical impossibility. So John is telling us from the very beginning, this one the one that I followed when I was a young man, the one that called me to be his disciple, the one that I witnessed doing the miracles that he did, the one I saw teaching as he did, that one, before I tell you who he is, what he did, before I tell you what it means to believe in him, I've got to tell you about his nature himself. He is non-contingent life. And then says John, see, it gets really interesting. He says, all things, I'm reading again verse 3, were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Now I'm in verse 4. In him was life. In him was life. See, life is in him. Now life has been given to me. But he is life in and of itself. And the life, he said, was the light of men. Now in the Bible, light is used differently than we commonly do. Um, most often when we talk about light, we talk about the enlightenment. Uh, enlightened individuals are individuals who have been educated, uh, who have been helped to see a number of things either in science or in other realms of human knowledge and are now shown something that we all know. So enlightenment means a discovery of the intellect. But in the Bible, uh, light means something else. It's not a reference to knowledge. 
It's a reference to righteousness. Um, it's a reference, if you will, to good versus evil. Darkness is unrighteousness, wickedness, and light is good. So John says, in him was life. That is, he is life in and of himself, and the life that he has is the light. It is the source of righteousness, good, moral good in the world. All things that are good in this world, everything that's pleasing, everything that blesses our lives in a good sense, comes from this source, says John. If there's any good in the world, it's because this one, Jesus, has willed that it should be there. In him was life, the life was the light of men. And then he adds, and this is the final word in the introduction, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness. Oh, that's, John's going to get to that. He's going to talk about the human condition, which has deeply been affected by rebellion against the Creator, which he will call sin, lawlessness. It's our lack of delight in God and lack of interest in God and our willingness to go our own way and to throw the decrees of God behind us and say, I can chart my own path. John calls that darkness. But then he says, the light, that is the one who is the word, the one who came into this world, who he's going to identify as Jesus, that light shines in the darkness and the darkness, he says, has not overcome it. It's a great image. Uh, you know that a darkness doesn't overcome light. Light overcomes darkness. And that's what John wants us to know. When Jesus came into the world, a light began to shine. And no amount of darkness in the world can eclipse what has begun to happen when Jesus came into the world. Again, let me get back to the theme. John wrote John to make sure that people who had heard about Jesus would know something about who he is and what it means to believe in him and the benefits that come to believing in him, which is eternal life. So before he can talk about any of the details of Jesus' life, he's got to paint a foundation. He's got to say, look, when I'm talking about Jesus, I'm talking about the one who is with the Father from the beginning and is one with the Father. You know, Christians always say there's but one God, but that one God exists in three distinct persons, and that's what eventually the New Testament is going to say. But John is here saying that this one is the one true God who came from the Father, and he entered into the world, and this one is light. He's light that drives darkness away. If there's any good in the world, it comes from him, and if darkness is to be defeated, it's going to come from him. John says, when you believe in this one, it will change everything. So I'm going to invite you to join me in this ongoing study of John chapter 1, you know, <laughs> wetting your appetite for a most remarkable book that tells us the story of Jesus in most remarkable terms. Thanks for joining me this week. Uh, if you've never come to know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I would invite you, keep on studying with me. Let's read the book of John together. Let's find out the foundation of what it is that God has done for this world, and let's find out how God wants you to respond. Thanks for joining me today. I want you to have a wonderful day. May the Lord bless you and uh, as you study God's Word together. 